So hi everyone and welcome to today's webinar, which is how to make a success of your global market expansion. Um, so I'm joined here today by Karen from Cult Beauty, who will be introducing himself a bit more formally shortly. Um, but Karen is an expert in logistics, um, so really looking at how we're actually exporting products, particularly cosmetics, oh. to global markets. Um, we'll begin to put a spotlight on Brexit, because obviously that's where we've seen a lot of changes in regulations. Um, recently this year. Um, so it's a really good focus when we're talking about kind of exporting to different markets about what those regulations can look like and the considerations you're going to have to make. So the agenda for today, we're going to be um, looking at an overview of e-commerce market. So what does that look like? What are online sales all about? And why should you be doing it and thinking about having a global market? We'll be looking particularly at Brexit and any changes that are happening for logistics. Um, I'll be talking a lot about advertising regulation globally and the kind of considerations you need to make there when you do have a global market um, and investigating new markets as well to ensure that if you're going to enter a new market, you're launching the right products there. So I'll be sharing a case study, which we'll look at that in more detail. Um, today's webinar is being recorded and I'll be sending out the recording at the um, end of the webinar. There's also going to be a Q&A, so if you've got any questions as we go through, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box, um, but also feel free to use the live chat. So if you want to share any experiences um, and you want to kind of um, converse with other people that are here today um, to share those experiences together and see what questions come out of that, please feel free to put them in there. Um, and when it comes to the end, we'll be looking at the live chat as well as the Q&A box um, to make sure we get all of your questions answered. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to Karim to introduce himself. Thanks, Karis. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to see you all. Um, and it's good to see a good attendance as well. Um, just a bit of a background from my side. In terms of my professional career, um, I started um, in logistics about 25 years ago, both on the commercial side and the freight forwarding side. So I've seen both sides of the fence. Um, some challenges that we've had, obviously, in freight forwarding and the commercial side especially when we moved on to Brexit in 2021. Um, I think for everyone, for all companies, I think that was one of the most challenging times for any company and for myself as well. So basically what we're gonna do is um, from the first seminar that we had in March, we kind of broke things down into little chunks. So this is just a follow on in terms to say that, you know, where, where we were from Brexit and where we are now five months on. Um, so yeah, I, I think It'll be an interesting conversation that we'll have with everyone today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, I'm the Regulatory Director at Aiton Global Research. So we spe specialise in global consumer research, uh, mainly product testing, uh, to basically uh, substantiate advertising claims. But as I mentioned, today we'll be really focusing on investigating new markets as well. Um, so getting your products tested, getting that feedback to make sure that you are um, meeting the needs of your target consumers um, and you make the best success of your global product launches. So to kind of give us an overview of today, I want to talk about the online sales market. Um, so really the overview from this is that online sales is where sales are going, um, especially I'll kind of go on to in a minute due to the pandemic that's happened this year. It's really going to continue to grow anyway, um, but it's always been growing over the last kind of few years. Um, so as you can see here, the kind of figures that we've got um, from 2019 to 2022 that we're expecting is in the trillions of US do dollars. Um, and it continues to grow as we, we kind of carry on through what we call as the information age. Everyone's got access to the internet. Um, in certain countries, in certain places, it's easier to shop online than it is in person. Um, so it's definitely gonna be something we see grow. Um, a lot of um, health, personal care and beauty sales are made online, so about 10% of all retail sales are made online, um, and as I mentioned, cosmetics is going to be a real focus for us today. Um, so it's something that we're really um, seeing to accelerate, things like social ads, influencers, that's all kind of adding towards this retail that we're seeing online. Um, so 
Yes, it's very important. And also it means that the global market is more accessible than ever. And you're also going to be in more of a global eye. So when it comes to regulations, which I'll talk about later, particularly for advertising, you need to be really, really aware of if you've got an online market, who's actually seeing your adverts and are you complying by their regulations? Uh, but as I mentioned, COVID-19 has also been a huge um, impact for the online sales market. As you know, um, you know, only recently here in the UK, if you're in the UK, um, shops only opened like last month. Um, so we've had things closed for a long time. Um, and in certainly in other countries, it's it's been very similar and certain places still aren't open for bricks and mortar. So it really is the way we're going to see things change. And I think there's going to be an impact where people have got very comfortable shopping online and don't necessarily want to go straight back into busy stores. Um, so we're just going to see these numbers rise and rise. Um, there was a couple of excerpts from uh, market research that I found interesting. And um, in the beginning of the pandemic in April, um, we saw uh, the beauty sales um, just in March or April uh, saw up to 53%, uh, which is an incredible part of the overall 111% um, increase in online sales that happened right at the beginning of the pandemic. So you can imagine how much that kind of increased anyway. Um, cross marketing strategies have always been a big part of um, online sales as well. Um, so really, this kind of um, quote here, it's something that has been put, um, put into place by companies to take a long time to set up when it comes to online sales. So I think what was interesting about it took up to five years. Now it's something that people have had to do this year. Um, so many brands that we've worked with have had to really put up their product testing and look at these new markets because there was no chance to wait around anymore and kind of um, wait for things to happen. It's had to be very now. Um, so I think it's still gonna be the case for a while for many brands. So over to you, Karen, to talk about uh, Brexit changes. Okay, thanks, Karis. Okay, so um, I've done it in four kind of phases in terms of what's, what's been illustrated on your screens now. So if you look at when we first started in January 21, um, we were, you know, the actual discussions of Brexit were taken about four or five years ago, saying that the, the UK will be, become a non-EU country, so we exited the EU. Um, in January 21, most companies faced those challenges um, for Brexit and we were um, presented with the UK border operating process as well in terms of how Brexit will be uh, formulated and, and how we would actually transition to, through the actual the Brexit parameters as well. So looking on the screen now you'll see how it's kind of phased out. So we've got Brexit January 21 and then phase two was um, the UK de minimis removal. So that basically means that, you know, from uh, in terms of the VAT, how we would be paying our VAT. So we had the de, min de minimis value of VAT being um, erased. So that means that anything that came into the UK, we had to pay VAT. We are paying VAT now. So whereas before, um, when we were part of the EU, the goods were in free circulation. Moving on to phase three in, January, in March 2021, that's when we had um, the IC, ICS2, um, and that's to do with the, um, the regulations, with security filing and everything as well. So when we move on to the next slides, I'll, kind of, I'll actually give you more detail in that. And then we move on to phase four, which is going to be expected in July 21, and that's the EU de minimis value of, of VAT and duty as well. Okay. Um, do you want to move on to the next slide, please, Karis? Okay, so here we are, the post-Brexit changes. Um, as we navigate through from January 21, um, what's important is to make sure all of our documentation um, is accurate, the URI numbers, the VAT numbers, and that's what I kind of clarified in one of the previous webinar sessions we had. The documentation has to be really accurate now, otherwise that's how they're going to actually do your customs declarations, your import VAT, how it's going to be paid as well. So number one, your URI numbers, and I'm sure that most, most of you now have your URI numbers registered, you have your VAT numbers, how you're going to be declaring um, the products as well, value of your goods, the actual terms of delivery as well, your freight, your insurance, your HS code, because that goes into the actual um, custom system, and that's how they're going to obviously um, customs clear your shipments. 
Um, what we've seen as well, and what I've kind of seen for myself is that when um, information is given, usually shippers will just put the gross weight and they'll say, well, why do I need the net weight? But the net weight is given because of the customs declarations. The customs declaration is usually used with the net weight because it's, it's done on a pro rata basis. And that's how they will calculate um, the value of goods based on your net weight, not the gross weight. So it's really important to make sure you have a clear description of your products and all the actual information on your invoices has to be accurate. So then that way your shipment is not delayed during the customs import process and the clearance process as well. So it's a straightforward um, process to be, uh, to be honest, but it's just making sure accuracy is really key now. Whereas before, when we were part of the EU, you could bring your shipments in and you just probably need a delivery note and a packing list because everything was in free circulation. And hence now, the UK is not part of the EU. We're a non-EU uh, country. And hence these, regu these regulations are now in place. And therefore we really would urge everybody on this call to make sure that you have accurate all your documents accurately completed, your URI numbers, your BAT numbers, your HS codes, your net weights, and your gross weights. Okay, next slide, please, Caris. <clears throat> okay, so in March 2021, we had the ISC2 import control system. Um, now, basically, why was this important? It's, for, it's all to do with security um, related uh, processes as well to ensure that when we are shipping our products, again, it's to make sure that we have, we complete. Um, the declarations properly and accurate descriptions on the way bills as well. So small parcel providers like DHLs, FedEx, they need that piece of information on their way bills. So many of you probably using DHL or, Fed, or FedEx or UPS, you will probably ask the question, we need you to complete all of that information on your way bills in order to um, ship your, uh, your consignment seamlessly to your end destination because that's where they're gonna be cleared and that's where they're gonna need that piece of information to ensure that your shipments are, are cleared properly. And also they have a clear description of your shipments as well. Whereas before, as you know, you could put um, cosmetic products on your way bills or anything like that and you'll transit through. However, now with these changes that are, that are in place, shipping from the, from the uh, UK to the EU, they need a full description of your products as well. And hence the reason why um, the small parcel providers have gone down this route because of the changes and the regulations that have taken place as well. So once again, it's to do with your customs clearance processes. It's to do with we have it for us to have the right type of information on the way bills. So then we can basically have our shipments transit through from A to B and to ensure that any security filing is done in the correct manner, in the correct process as well. Okay, next slide, please. Right, so this is the, the next challenge that we could be facing. And this is the sec this is probably the last phase of the, um, the customs border process. And it's the removal of the de minimis VAT value as well. So at the moment, there's, there's a lot of discussions taking place and uh, lots of companies are actually preparing themselves for this as well. Um, when you've been talking to your small parcel providers, they've been probably asking you um, how you're going to be clearing your shipments, the way you're going to be uh, filing your VAT. Some companies would have physical representation in place. Some companies will probably ask their small parcel providers or their carrier to re-invoice the VAT back to them. However, what's happening here is the removal of the, the customs VAT. So all uh, what's gonna happen is anything that's under 150 euros, the VAT will be paid at the country of destination when it arrives. And then your small parcel, your carrier will probably um, invoice that back to you. However, anything that's over 150 euros, the duty and VAT is paid directly at the country of destination as well. Now, this is where it's a bit of a sticking point where we have also something called the one stop uh, import, the import one stop shop, where your carrier will be able to handle that for you. But also the fact where the VAT, how, how is that going to be paid and recharged back to you as well? So there's a lot of discussions taking place at the moment in terms of 
verifying and formulating the actual process for the VAT and how that VAT will be billed back to the customer or to, uh, to the shipper. Um, usually you can have the VAT which will be um, paid at the checkout point um, and then you are uh, then when the shipment actually arrives at that, the destination point that's when it's already been paid for. If you don't want to go for the import one-stop shop process what will happen is that the VAT is paid by your customer and only then will they be able to release the shipment for final delivery. So as I said, there's a lot of discussion taking place with lots of carriers at the moment in terms of um, having the last bit of formalization of this process. And I would say by um, end of May, June, this will be kind of nailed down to say, right, this is gonna be the process. But basically the long and short of it is anything under 150 euros, your VAT will be payable by your carrier and they will bill that back within um, the monthly declarations of your VAT, how you file your VAT. If you don't wish to go for the import one-stop shop process, what will happen is that either if you have physical representation in place of the, um, the country of destination where you can file your VAT for anything over 150 euros, um, then that VAT can be um, reclaimed back. Your, your um, physical representative will build that back to you or the carrier will put a physical representative in place based on their custom brokerage they have in place in destination country, and they can build that back to you. So long and short of it at the moment, lots of carriers are discussing this. They're just formulating the last end process of how this will be dealt with. And as soon as they have that formulated, I think um, by around, uh, like I said, end of May, June, um, you'll probably be hearing back from your carriers. So they're like, this is how we're gonna actually build back the actual VAT as well. So this will be the last process of the, um, the, 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 operate, the border operating process that we will see for Brexit. But as we said, um, you know, we can say how long is a piece of string at the moment, but hopefully I think we can probably see the light at the end of the tunnel for May or June uh, on this one as well. Okay. Amazing. Thanks, Karen. I think it's, um, as you said, it's one of those things that have been dragged out. There's always seems to be another change with Brexit. So uh, there's lots right. of uncertainty, I think, about this next change, but hopefully that will be the last one and, and everyone can start selling with a bit more confidence and having that export with a bit more confidence. Um, but one thing that hasn't changed because of Brexit is advertising regulation. Um, so I really wanted to talk about this, um, and I said go into a case study, um, because every country has its own advertising regulations, and that's never been something that's been an EU thing. It's very much been a country by country basis. Um, there is a council that covers all of Europe, but because it's not EU based, um, it really is geographical. Um, so for those of you who don't know anything about advertising regulation or are unsure about about it, um, it's really important when you are looking at exports. Um, so regardless of it, if it's a Brexit um, kind of change, or if you're trying to get into the EU, or if you're just trying to get into any global market, as I mentioned earlier, if you're selling globally, you need to be conscious of the regulations in the country that you are selling your product. So it doesn't matter if it's a cosmetic, doesn't matter if it's food, doesn't matter if it's electrical, it will all come under the same regulation. And what we're really talking about here is advertising claims. So every product that you want to sell, obviously we want your market to really boast about the benefits your product can do. Um, and everything you say about it then becomes a claim that you're making about your product um, because it's something that you're basically showing your consumer um, that your product can perform. So advertising self-regulation is the way that industry tends to regulate itself globally, um, apart from some exceptions, um, which basically means that instead of it being a federal organization, instead of it being a law in particular, it's these um, kind of organizations are set up to assist the governments um, and put out code of conduct out there that um, companies should abide by if they're selling in that territory. It can then go into legality if you don't abide by their kind of rules. But the idea is instead of the kind of government going through every single advert that's on the public domain and having to sift through it and make sure it's um, compliant, we're really putting the onus on brands themselves. Um, so there's three parts of the industry there. Uh, it's the advertisers who pay for the advertising, the advertising agencies responsible for its form and content and the media that carry it. If you 
are any of those three, you need to be responsible and knowing what the advertising regulations are in that country and making sure that you're abiding them um, because you can come under scrutiny from those authorities. How does it work? How does it regulate itself? It's basically on a complaint system. So whether you're a consumer and you see, uh, you know, if you purchase a product, for example, it's, I don't know, um, a hair mousse and it says it's going to be non-crunchy and make your hair soft while still making it curly, uh, but you get it and you don't think it performs in that way and you're not happy with it, uh, you might complain to the advertising authority in your country to say, I've been sold this product, it doesn't do what it's saying um, and I'm not happy with it. They'll then investigate that brand um, or that advert and see where the evidence is that, that came from to say that it could perform in that way. And it's the same for competitors as well. So if you have, for example, um, if you're selling a product in the country, and um, one of your competitors launches it, um, but has some claims about the product that you don't believe, because you know you've got a very similar product that can't do those things, or that you couldn't get the evidence to prove it, um, or that they're making a medical claim when it's a cosmetic, all of these kinds of things, um, you can put in a complaint to the advertising authority as well about that competitor brand. Um, so it really does, uh, it does work in a really good way there. There are obviously um, policing that does go on as well, especially when it comes to things like um, Abbott's being offensive or harmful. But really, this is all about based on this complaints basis. It makes sure that it's a fair playing field, really. If you're being fair to your consumers by not overselling something that you know, they're not going to be getting for their money, um, but also fair to your competitors, it's really important to have this competitive market um, where everyone's kind of putting their money into investing in their brand rather than just saying what they want about their product and it not performing. So a couple of resources are there for you. Um, there's the ICC, which is the International Chamber of Commerce. They have a framework that countries adopt um, for self-regulate advertising self-regulation. Um, so it's quite a good starting point because you can see what countries have adopted that framework um, and, and then kind of go from there to see what, if that country is on your list. And there's also the International Council of Advertising Self-Regulation. And again, they have a members list. So you can find really easy who are those organizations in the country you're selling your product. Um, it is important to note that even if there isn't an advertising organization, there's always advertising laws and almost every country has got something um, based on it to say you can't mislead your consumers. So kind of looking at advertising regulation then, um, but also thinking about this export um, kind of breath kind of overall we've got when we're talking about global expansion I want to go through a case study so in this example I've used Europe because again if we were putting this into context with Brexit if you're selling in the UK and you wanted to expand to Europe it's very complicated as we now know into the EU sorry um, to, to, to expand there with all of these different import tax. So do you want to go ahead and launch there when you don't know how your product's going to perform? Um, you need to kind of do a risk assessment and say, which country should we sell this product in? Um, because we need to make sure that we're going to be able to set up all of this logistics whilst ensuring we're going you know, still make a success out of our brand launch. Um, so this is an example I've brought up for this where we're looking at different testing in different countries across Europe and seeing how the product performs there. Um, so in this case, this was a global leader in um, wholesale of pharmacy and health and beauty products. They already have, um, you know, very, Good key markets in the UK and USA. Um, they do have some markets in Europe, but they again want to see where the claims perform best. So that's where they can invest um, all their marketing. So the countries we looked at were Spain, Germany, France, Italy, and Portugal. And the key claims they were looking at um, is testing a day and night cream, and they wanted to see if it was suitable for all skin types, if it had anti-aging um, claims supported, and if the products perform well in a hot climate. So obviously, we're looking at those kind of territories, it had to be conducted in the summer, but there's going to be varying climates within those countries as well. So what one kind of consumer might think is a hot climate might be very different to the other. So it's really important we get that feedback. We also wanted to see the propensity to buy the product. So consumer testing, um, which is what this is, you know, in-home user testing, is a great way to assess this. We can look at the product performance, but we're also looking at the market research. Overall in that market, who would buy the product? And let's compare those markets as well. So as you can see, there's a lot of reasons why we're conducting this study. Um, so it's a really important for this brand for us to conduct it. So how did we design it? 
Obviously, the countries I've already mentioned were Spain, Germany, France, Italy, and Portugal. It's a regime test, so they're testing a day and night cream and looking at the kind of combined effects of using the products together to make sure they can sell them as a duo. It was a six week study. As I mentioned, they had some anti aging claims they wanted to make. Generally, for anti aging, we're looking at about six weeks at least because. Uh, things like, you know, reducing the appearance of wrinkles, dark spots, that all takes time to have an effect when you're using a product. So we need to make sure we've left lots of time. We were reflecting all skin types. So making sure we had a split of skin types across the across um, the panel panelists in each country, uh, but definitely with 25% with sensitive skin. So weighted towards those with sensitive skin, um, mainly because it's uh, because it is sensitive. We want to make sure we've got lots of data to say it's suitable for that skin type. We wanted people with um, skin, photo skin types one to three, so fairer skin types. Um, this is quite common when you're looking at um, products for SPF because they can have a tint to them. Um, and we also had an age of 25 to 55. Again, this is quite common for anti-aging. The skin starts to age around 50 to 25 where you can start to see some appearances uh, and then you kind of get that range up to 55 there. Obviously, we wanted them to use anti-aging products already um, because we didn't want them to have kind of any aging problems with their skin that were going to be severe because otherwise it can kind of put a bias towards the product. Um, so we wanted it to be a reasonable con end consumer that already uses anti-aging products and we want them to switch to this one. So once we've conducted the study, we've sent out all our products to all of our different countries. They've come and answered an online questionnaire about it. We get a report that we give to our client. Um, so I've just taken a very small snippet from the, from the questions we asked. Um, and this is also just from the summary at the bottom of the report, which simply says how many people agree with that every single claim or every single question we've asked. So on the left-hand side, we've got the questions or the statements. We then ask them if they agree or not with those statements. And we have uh, the number of people that had a satisfied answer and the number of people that had a not satisfied answer and then the percentages for satisfied and not satisfied there. So this is really important when we're looking at claims because that percentage, A, it tells us as it passed a statistical majority. So usually we look at a two thirds majority to pass a claim, but also as I'm sure you're all aware when you put these kinds of claims into your marketing, you like to quote the percentage of people and how many people agreed with that claim. So in this case, we had 84% of people in the study agreed that their skin was protected from redness with flushing associated with the heat. Again, we wanted to look at hot climates and how this product performs in those climates. 92% of people agreed that the serums were suitable to use in summer. 98%, which is a huge, huge percentage, agreed that the serum reduces the appearance of their wrinkles. As you can see, we had 299 people on this study. So for 98% of 90, 299 people to agree with a claim is a very successful um, product. So it's really good to see and get those claims for our clients. Uh, and then 91% of people said their skin feels boosted with vitality. Again, these anti-aging claims we're talking about. Um, so as you can see, this launch is incredibly successful overall. When we're looking at all of those different markets together, this is what we're getting. Um, and we can kind of launch straight away. We know that people agree with these claims. We, we can launch those products with those claims. But it's really important to think about breaking down the countries anyway, um, because obviously if the, you know, if the claims overall pass, uh, we need to assess it and go, OK, it might have passed in the countries overall, but if we're going to take them out one by one, um, do we have those claims passed in each country? And also, is it worth launching the products in all, every country? So we've broken down some of these um, questions um, by the, the kind of country basis to give you an overview here. So this line that's going across the graph, this blue line, is our two thirds majority that I mentioned before. So this um, question was about the skin being protected from redness, um, flushing associated with the heat. We can see it's passed in every country, um, but as you can see, Spain is very, very high up, nearly 100%, and Germany is actually just over 66%. So we know that we've um, achieved the claim, but it still might be that actually it's not as good as it looks overall in the data when we see that overall data. Um, so when we look at the serums are suitable for use in summer, again, really high percentages, but you can really see the difference now about where it's the most accepted. So most accepted in Spain again, and least accepted in Italy, but still quite a high percentage. Um, again, boosted with vitality, we can see the breakdown there. Um, and again, Germany is kind of our lower one there. 
Um, and also about if the price was right, would you purchase it? Now, this is really, really important because this was one of our um, kind of main key claims to say, if we're going to sell the product there, um, who's actually going to purchase it? Now, this is where it becomes slightly interesting. The orange on the graph reflects people that um, who had a negative answer, so said they wouldn't buy it. The blue is the people that said they would buy it, but the gray is the people that weren't sure. So now when we look at Germany, we can actually see that the majority of the panelists are sitting within the unsure, the neutral response. So when we're going back to the brand, even though we've got an overall positive um, response to the comments in every um, in its response to the claims in every country, and even though it's not a negative response to buying the product in Germany, it does make us really reflect whether actually it's worth launching the product there um, and setting up all those logistics. Um, so overall, uh, the claims were validated in every country. The highest purchase interest was in all the southern European countries, which is interesting because they're also the hotter climates, and this is what this product was really designed for. Um, but Germany is quite moderate with their interest, um, and yeah, it's it's kind of unsure about whether that's a go ahead. I guess my my kind of um, come away from that would actually be to increase the panel size in Germany alone and look at that on its own and sort of say, okay, let's ask fifty more people would they uh, purchase that product, and then you've got more data behind that claim to give a more reliable result. Um, just an important kind of comment before we go to the Q&A as well, is to really think about your adverts in each country. And this is where we were, I was kind of saying about earlier, not about advertising standards, but also about how your adverts are received in every country, again, by doing that kind of product feedback. Um, so when you have a claim that's going out on your online website, that's going out to every market, you need to think about whether it's appropriate for each country. So a big thing um, that's happened over the last year is Unilever of cha changing the name for Fair and Lovely Skin Lock Lightning Cream in India. Again, it's quite interesting that they're just choosing one market um, to change it with. And this is really coming out of everything that's kind of going on about colorism in the cosmetics industry. Um, so it's not necessarily that they're actually changing the product at all, which I think is quite interesting when we're looking at the claims that are behind it. But they are changing the um, the, the name of the, the product to make sure it's not coming across as offensive. Um, kind of putting that wording together fair and lovely is suggesting that darker skin maybe isn't so lovely. Um, so really important, again, to think about where you're kind of marketing the products and how it's going to be received by that consumer. Um, there's also in China, um, a, a blogger actually picked up on Le Mer for um, having false advertising. So this was to do with claims they were using on Chinese consumers, um, but weren't actually showing to other markets. And when the blogger looked into it, they found that actually they weren't supposed to be saying these claims. They had no evidence behind it, but they were essentially getting away with it in China, but not in other markets, um, kind of using that advertising regulation to their advantage. I would say that new regulations in China for cosmetics would really crack down on this now. But back in 2018, they kind of got away with it a bit. Um, so they were called out on it, reported it to their advertising um, standards, as I mentioned, and they had to um, change that advert. And another important one was from Proactive, where they were using um, different testimonials and claims from their American campaign and selling it in the UK. But actually, the UK product doesn't have the same ingredients. So therefore, um, if you tested, you know, two different products with different, two different ingredients, you're going to get different evidence behind those claims. Um, so again, it was kind of an, an oops on their half. Again, you know, a lot of these brands aren't doing things because they mean to. This can happen by accident. And in this case, that was kind of an accidental mistake by showing an advert for something that actually is a different product in the wrong market. Um, it's just really, again, I'm just kind of bringing up things to say, this is how easy it is to make these mistakes. Uh, really research the markets you're launching into and make sure that you have the right evidence, the right claims and the right adverts that are appropriate for that country. Um, so just to kind of summarize today before we go to our questions at the end, I can see a few have come in. Um, so as Karim said, there are still Brexit regulations that are being implemented and you need to look out for these changes in the 1st of July. We should know more within the next couple of months. Um, you need to test in representative markets um, if you're looking at substantiating your claims. So again, one thing I didn't really kind of comment on 
was we're thinking about what those um if you have a global market say you have evidence for just the uk if you're then selling the product in for example the united arab emirates where it's a much hotter climate and you've got oilier skin types you're not necessarily going to get the same results so it's really important if you have a global market to make sure you have some representative data from different countries um, you should always use consumer research to establish the product acceptability in those key markets again. Um, so don't take the risk. Don't just launch your product there. Get some feedback from your consumers and see what they have to say about your product. And always look out for the advertising standards um, that are specific to the country that you are selling your product and make sure you're abiding by those rules. So I'm going to get open up for some questions now um, and I can see a couple of come in. So let's have a little see what people have asked. Um, so Andre has asked about the case study. Um, do we know why Germany is more neutral? Is it due to their cultural habits um, or they, do they think they have better other offers? Well, that's something that we can really investigate. But generally, yes, Germany does tend to have a more negative response um, than other countries as a flat rule, um, which is always one thing we kind of look at. We always say um, India has a really amazing response generally um, uh, and Germany has more negative response. If you really want to know how your product performs, test in both. If your product performs negatively in India, you know there is something wrong with the product. Um, and if it um, performs really positively in Germany, you know there's probably something very right with the product um, so it's always something to consider that and we do look into those aspects we have a specialist franchise in Germany who really understands the market over there um, so we always make sure kind of study and questionnaire design is going through him specifically um, but yeah it can also be because they have other products on the market that they're more interested in and um, that can be a huge thing as well. So generally with stuff like that, that's an overview. We can then do further research to look into it. We can ask further questions um, and, and yeah, get some more feedback on that. That's the beauty of consumer research is you can keep, keep going, you know, keep delving into it until um, you kind of get to the bottom of these things. Um, so Karim, over to you for the uh, question about the net weight. Oh, Karen, I can't hear you. Sorry, <laughs> we got mute on that. <laughs> Typical thing. I'm on mute. Okay. <laughs> Try that um, again. <laughs> question on the net weight. Um, basically, the net weight that that that's calculated minus the weight of any kind of packaging of the item, etc., and what's loaded onto um, uh, onto the container or into the actual carton as well. So, the net weight is just the packaging and the actual goods, uh, the, the product itself. Perfect. And there's another question for you here as well, okay. um, which is what does the removal of EU VAT de minimis actually mean in real terms? Um, not sure if I was clear on the explanation. Does it mean that if you ship a product from the UK to the EU, the company has to pay VAT at both ends? Yeah, so basically, no, you're, you're, you're paying your VAT once it arrives in the actual country of destination. Now, Either it's done at um, on, on the checkout point when you're actually, uh, if, if it's for e-commerce, you pay out on the checkout if you're not going to be signing up to the import one-stop uh, shop process, or it's paid at the destination country. So depending on how your INCO terms are formed as well, um, that's how the VAT will be paid. So you're not paying it twice, you pay it once, but it's based on your INCO terms. And it's also based on um, how you wish to actually have the VAT paid. So you can pay usually out on checkout where the customer will pay that on checkout. Or um, if it arrives in the destination country, then you would have, you can, um, if you have physical representation in place, that VAT is then basically paid by your physical representative and they will bill that back to you depending on um, if it's below the threshold of 150 euros or over. But you only pay the VAT once, it's not twice. I've got a question for that as a consumer, um, just mm -hmm. my own understanding, because it's, you know, I'm not a logistics expert. Um, so if you were to purchase something, potentially, if companies don't get this set up correctly, um, yeah. and I purchase something over £150, or if I was in the EU and I did it, would you, you know how you can get kind of get things in from other countries and you're lumped with this massive import tax um, when yeah. you kind of get the product? Is that the risk that face, that consumers are facing if this isn't set up? <clears throat> That's correct, yes. So basically, um, it's 
you, you pay the VAT and duty depending on sometimes on, on, um, on the actual uh, websites as well, they would actually say to you what the VAT and duty is going to be payable at destination and some of the actual customers will have to pay that VAT and duty or they'll calculate it um, uh, prior to shipping. So you kind of know how much your VAT and duty is going to be for that particular product, if any duty is applicable. And then when it arrives in that country, the, the parcel provider will then contact you to say, okay, we have your parcel um, and you are liable to pay import VAT and duty. Um, that's where you would actually pay that import VAT and duty as well. Yeah. Um, if that's not the case, what happens is as well that you can pay it prior before the actual shipment leaves. So you pay it on checkout and that means you've paid your import duty and VAT. Mm, that's, it's, it's scary, I think, for a lot of our clients. I know that their products really range from under 100 to over 150. So I think it's that right. a lot of, um, especially beauty brands, are going to be really affected by that because a lot of people do have products that really range above and below that. Um, so it's quite, yeah, quite worrying. I think something people yeah. really need to be aware of. That's right. Um, I mean, like, like we said, you know, what, what's happening at the moment, uh, until they actually um, have a proper formula, um, of how the VAT is going to be paid. And this is where all the small parcel carriers are looking into it to say, okay, what's going to be the best process for us? Do we put our own physical representatives in place to actually get the VAT paid on behalf of our uh, shipper and then we build it back? Or do we have um, the customer that will pay at end destination for that VAT as well? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, it's up in the air, but I, th I think, like I said, by the end of May, June, they will have basically come up with a formula to say this is how we're going to actually handle this process yeah well hopefully, hopefully it all becomes really aware like transparent with people soon so yeah. we all know um i did see a hand raise if you have a question if you just put it into the chat we can answer it i can't see any other questions coming in right now so i'm going to close i'm going to start closing off the webinar but if anyone pops up just um i'll, I'll um carry on um, so, um, just to kind of summarize as well, I've got a couple of upcoming webinars um, next month that you're all, of course, welcome to join. Um, so, on the 21st of May, we'll be looking at substantiating claims for supplements. Um, and on the 28th of May, I'll be joined by um, Thomas Marquardt, who's our German franchisee to look about um, some market research we've conducted, which is all to do with life after COVID and how people's cosmetic habits will change or possibly stay the same um, when we're looking to an optimistic close of this pandemic. Um, there'll be no webinar next week because I'll be at Cosmetics Business Live exhibiting. So for anyone that is coming to join, please do come visit the stand. Um, and if you haven't yet got your ticket, I would recommend you do. It's a week packed full of lectures that are going to cover everything across the cosmetics industry. Um, so thank you so much for joining me today, Karen. It's fantastic to have your expertise on okay. board. <laughs> I'll be sending out the recording shortly um, and I'll include myself and Karen's um, contact information on there. So if you do have any other questions that you didn't get a chance to ask today, uh, please do feel free to contact us and we'll be really happy to help. Uh, so thank you for everyone for joining and thank you again, Karen. Um, it's been no an problem. absolute pleasure to work with you on this. Thank um, you. I hope everyone has a really fantastic weekend and thank you very much. Thank you. Bye now.